I think from the, the get-go on, on Series 5, you, it's very clear when Morgana Glee just applies. You know, you, you leave her at the end of Series 4, and for me, and I, I don't know about Ruth, but I think Series 4 and 5 feels like one big series for the first time. It is an entire... So it almost feels like an American show of the 26 episodes. It, it, even though there's a break of three years, the storyline is sort of a direct continuity yeah. going on. And, and that's very true for Morgana. You know, you leave her at the end, and, you know, she's bent on destruction and payback, and series five opens, and she's the same. She's more committed because there's more time has gone by. And you discover later on in the season that she has been directly persecuted for, for being magical, and that has driven her even more to sort of hate Camelot and Arthur and, and everything that, that uh, the Knights of the Round Table stand for. So yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very much a sort of direct continuation of series four, except I think in, in the great tradition that um, our execs, John and Julian, have started, in that they found a formula that worked, and, and they've moved on with it. They haven't just rested on it, and, and series five is, is even darker, and it, it's sort of more intense, and it's, it's more filmic, and it's, it's more grown up. So what they started in seasons three, three and four mm -hmm. are now continuing again in, in series five. And that's the great thing about doing a long series, is that you know you, you get your audience and then they grow with it, yeah. and you can grow along with them. So we're, we're sort of five years older now, and, and I think that's sort of reflect on our scripts and, and what we're doing. I think when you say scary, I think, I think it is, it's more grown up, but it's not frightening. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of more sinister than it is scary, and I think, I think what's great about Merlin is that it works on so many different levels, yeah. and it's kept that as it's gone on. I mean, you could, it's one thing you can say about it is that you can watch it as a five-year-old, you can watch it with your grandmother, and Series 5 still has that. While it is more sinister in sort of tones, it has still got the light moments and the yeah. banter and all of those things, and I think for an audience, you take from it what you want. Mm -hmm. And so a five-year-old is going to look at the fun between Meryl and Arthur and the bits with the knights and everything like that, I'm going to enjoy that. Whereas sort of the older people will get the sort of, you know, the war between brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and, you know, the fight for the crown. So that's what's really clever about Merlin. I think that's what's made it last so long, <laughs> is that it appeals to so many. And I think what they've done, and I think it definitely puts in with what Rupert is saying, in the last two series, the stakes have gotten higher for all the characters. Whereas there was, you know, a sort of a more lightness and frivolity of the first three seasons in four and five, everything, the stakes are higher, yeah. and the stakes are higher for every character that's in it. I mean, obviously mine is, you know, she's completely changed, but it's the same for the knights. There, the, there's less of the sort of standalone episode, and, and now it's more of a continuous story. Four and five is definitely, for me, I think it's more telling... It, four and five for me was sort of the start of telling of the actual legend that everybody knows, and it's telling them as a continuous story rather than. But still, you know, still every episode is still different, but you're still telling an overall story, which yeah. I find four and five is really doing now. Um, and and as as an actor, I think it's it's sort of more fun because you feel like you've got thirteen hours to, do, to deal with a character rather than sort of you know four or five. I think the storyline hooks you at the start, and you don't want to let it go, because if you miss an episode, then, well, you don't know what's happened to mm. Guinevere, and, and what, what is Sir Leon doing with his top off? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you not want to, makes you want to stay in on a Saturday night and make sure you know what happened to all these characters, because after five years, I think people have grown to, well, we're lucky, really, really love everybody and really care for every single mm. one storyline, and that's a tough thing to do, and, um, and they've managed it. We've done more than any years. We're actually on location more than we have ever yeah. been, and on location in England more. We don't film mm. in France as much, and we don't film in the studio as much because sort of the they're going for such a open, vast feel. And you know, if you think about the legend, you think very much about the countryside and location. And, and this year they they've gone out into Wales, and we use more castles, we use more forests, we use travel. It seems like we're sort of living off buses. This year. <laughs> yeah. than we are anywhere else. We use all sort of the same ones that we've used before. We use yeah. Raglan and Caerphilly and, and all sort of the great... I mean, Wales has such a rich history mm. of sort of mm. militarism and sort of being the border states. There's so many to choose from. I mean, we're really lucky that we get to film around here. You know, we don't film in France as much anymore, which is sad, because it's kind of like our school home. <laughs> 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 but um, we get to be around here, which is nice. It's, you know... Something about Wales feels, I know it sounds really, really cliche, but feels very magical. Mm. Feels like you should be here to tell the legend. You're going, oh my god, it's freezing, it's two degrees above, and, and it's raining, and it's cloudy, and you're just like, yes, we can work with that. And they're just sitting there. <laughs> and they're in, in London with their tea and their biscuits. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a 
girl, I yeah. think. I, I always read her as a girl. Um, I, I, when I spoke to the producers last year, our, our producer, Julian and Johnny, they're extremely clever and they know everything about all the legends. And what I wasn't aware, and I've read quite a lot, is that there's the red dragon and the white dragon in the mm -hmm. legends that represent England and Wales historically and so he really wanted to bring that in so you've got the red dragon in Kilgara and you've got Athusa being the white dragon and the one thing that um, Merlin does really well is the balance so good versus evil lightness versus dark so I think that's where they were going with that but I like your idea that it's girls versus boys and I'm going to be <laughs> way better um, I think I think if you're going to set up two people as sort of the flip side of the coin sort of, you have to make them as equal as possible and I think with Athusa, I think you get that so that Merlin and Morgana are sort of both sides to the same coin. But I think Athusa choosing Morgana is a really interesting way of sort of saying that Morgana isn't evil, she isn't good, she is what she is, and magic is not evil or good, it's not good or bad, it just is. And I think the fact that something is pure and, and wonderful as sort of, you know, a, a newly born and hatched white little dragon <laughs> <laughs> chooses Morgana, I think that tells you that. It, it doesn't matter, it's not good versus evil, magic just is, and it ha doesn't choose a side, it chooses. It doesn't, do you know what I mean? And I think that's what they're trying to say with the Thusa. But again, it's girls versus boys. <laughs> um, I think you can't tell the story of, of Merlin or of Arthur or of Camelot without Mordred. But I've said it a million times in a million interviews, and it still is true now, that the great thing about Merlin is it's going to give you the legend, but not as you expect. So obviously we have Mordred, and he is wonderful, and Alex is brilliant, but don't think that you know how he's going to come into the show, because you don't. And that's what's wonderful about Merlin, that's what keeps people watching, yeah. is that everything's a guess, no nothing is how you think it is. So Athusa isn't how you think she is, and, and Mordred isn't how he is. So, you know, try and get some teasers out of Alex, he won't give you anything, but <laughs> <laughs> you can try. But he fits in brilliantly, like they brought every bit of the Arthurian legend in to tell mm. the story, and, and it works in their way, you know? It, it's a weird, it's not weird. I mean, you, we pretty much have nearly the same crew that we started with. And it kind of makes you feel like, for me, this was pretty much my first big job. So I feel the same as I did when I started because there is no egos on the show. There can't be, because if you do step out of line, you know, Gary Chase, DR, Spark will tell you that you've stepped out of line type of thing, because we're all in it together. You know, and it's a pretty small crew for such a big show. So it doesn't feel like we're making anything massive until we go to France. Yeah. And then you sort of realize, because France is an open monument, so anybody can come visit and watch you filming. And you know, you're there with 300 people watching you. It's incredible. With canvas. <laughs> the whole range of it. You get some people dressing up in costume. You get a lot of people coming bringing you presents. So they've made things, you know, books, photographs pictures, um, and some people just come because they're tourists and they've heard you're there, so it's right the way across. You get real commissioned people who've come from China, and you get people who've just been in the area. And these people, you get that aside, and they're all lovely, but they come just to, they've heard you filming there and they want to see you and they've brought you presents, and that's when you realize what it is that you're working on. And, you know, them just standing there all day wanting just to be part of it. And, and that's a very humbling experience. Very respectful of the show and the fans. I think they're very, as, as, a, as a group, the fans, I think, are very respectful to each other and other people who yeah. like them. And they don't step on anybody's toes. And to this day, now I'm five years in, I have yet to have a bad experience with fans. And we get hundreds yeah. a day when we're out there, and even, you know, in England, have yet to have anybody be in any way negative. And I'm not sure there are many shows you can say that about. Yeah. My favourite is when they take an idea and they sort of spin it. So there's a dog that turns up on set called Merlin, who's dressed yeah. up like Colin. What? <laughs> Swear to God, little dog called Merlin that they bring, and yeah. it's dressed like Colin. And then there'll be a girl who will wear an Arthur outfit, but she'll take Arthur's outfit and make it feminine. So you get all these type of different, you know... <coughs> so there's a the girl I met in Comic-Con who was dressed up like Asa and had big blue contact lenses in. Mm -hmm. So they sort of flip everything, and, and it's things that you don't realise. You know, like there's an episode where Colin wears this ridiculous hat. <laughs> And she made, one girl made the hat and was oh, wearing it. So she was yeah. amazing. Though. She was crazy. Brilliant. Yeah. But so that's what's really great is that they do dress up like you, but it's sort of like an art project where they take it and, and make it to their own. You hear it's horror great. stories about other people and, and their fans and things like that. And it's honestly shocking because I've yet, like I said, yet to have a bad experience. Mm -hmm. 
and and I, I think it makes us feel very very lucky. Mm. There's something about the show that just sort of captured people's imaginations and attracted very nice people to follow it. <laughs> No, oh, I get people going up, oh my god, you are such a <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it amazing? You're so good at it. And I'm going, are they telling me I'm a <laughs> Or are they saying I'm really good at playing it? <laughs> no, it's, it's generally people going, oh, you're just so good at it. And she's so great now that she's bad. It's never, oh, I don't like her anymore. They're all like, no, we love her so much more. Everybody. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me, but...